Good afternoon. This is Tuesday, November 14th, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Randy Brewer of Natick Pegasus, our local cable access station. We're privileged today to have with us Kenneth Smith. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. Can I ask you when you were born? Yes, I was born on April 30th, 1925. And where were you born? I was born in Newburgh, New York, which we grew up in Walden, New York, just about 10 miles west of there. And where do you currently live? We live in Ashland right now. And how long have you lived in Ashland? We have been there 10 years. And are you married? Yes. Your wife's name? Marlia. And do you have children? Yes, we have three sons. Any grandchildren? Two. Where and when did you decide to enter into the military? Well, it was 1943 and we were right in the midst of World War II. And in our high school class there were 12 boys and we were all deferred to graduate. And we graduated towards the middle of June and one week later we all had our call draft papers and we all went to New York and were inducted into the service. Everyone at that time went into the Navy because obviously they needed Navy people then. So you went into the Navy with a number of your friends? Yes. Um, you joined, you said, because it was in the middle of the war. Did you have any other concerns about maybe joining another branch or? Well, I had an older brother in the Navy and I was familiar with the Navy and uh, we all kind of liked the Navy. And we didn't like this idea of man-to-man -man combat too much. <laughs> so you thought Navy was so the I way to the go. So I Navy would be a lot better. Uh, were you and your friends sent off to basic training together? Uh, we, most of us all went to uh, Sampson up in the middle of New York State by Geneva. And uh, we were there. For how long? I think we were there from the end of June to maybe the middle of September. I don't remember for sure, but it was about that length of time. Do you remember anything about BASIC that you liked or didn't like? Well, it was the first time I ever fainted. And it was when I had uh, three or four shots in one day and they were all standing at tension with our rifles. And down I went. And when I went down, about four or five others started going. So we had the afternoon off <laughs> because of that. Had you ever had a problem with having shots before? No, never. It just sort of happened. Was it a warm day? Do you remember that? It was a hot day, yes it was. Um, beyond basic, did you receive any advanced or specialized training? Well, we went from there, we went to, uh, at least some of us, to Richmond, Virginia, and went to a diesel school down there. Now, what prompted them to send you to diesel school? Did you have to take any kind of testing? Well, I took a lot of testing in uh, at Sampson basic training. And then uh, we did have preferences for schools, and I happened to put down diesel because I thought it would be a good thing to get involved in. And they accepted it okay. Did any of your friends go with you? One, but not from our hometown, but another friend from the area, yes. Was that your specialty during the remainder of your military career, working in, with diesels? Well, yes and no, yes and no. And what uh, do you mean? Well, when, after I we went up to submarine school, then we kind of were separated into different things at that time. I, I had diesel training also up there, but when we finally got onto a submarine, I uh, got out of the engine room because it's so hot and so forth that I couldn't handle it too well. So I became an auxiliary and took care of the pump, the refrigeration, the air compressor, and all that sort of equipment. <clears throat> Do you remember, you said it was too hot, was it claustrophobic for you also, or were you used to that? No, it was, no because uh, going through sub-school, sub we took all sorts of claustrophobic tests and pressure tests and all that, and we had no problem there. But uh, in a, it really got warm in the, in the submarine uh, engine room. And then they took salt pills. And I just didn't handle it with the salt and all that. I had a little bit of a problem there. 
And when I got an auxiliary crew, it was a lot better because right in the uh, maneuvering room and the conning tower and all that area, so we got all the basic information and it was very interesting from that time on. So where would that have been in, um, with regard to, some of us aren't sure about the makeup of a submarine. Talk about the different layers. Well, the submarine, <coughs> submarine I was on was a fleet type submarine. And uh, most of them in World War II were, except in the early part of the war, they had some S boats and older boats were in it, which really took a brunt of the, the, of the battle at that time. But the sub we were on had a forward torpedo room and they had the forward battery area, then they had the control room, and the two engine rooms behind that, and then the after torpedo room. And of course, it was all one level, and then we had the conning tower right above the control room, and that was basically it. And where would you have been? I would have been in the control room. Below the control room, there was a pump room that had a lot of refrigerators and compressors and things of that nature. So you're on this submarine in Virginia? No. At this point, where we were you? We went from diesel school, I went to submarine school up in New London. And I was there from uh, about September, and I think we got done there around the beginning of April. Of course, at that time, everybody put in for new construction because then you'd be assigned to a brand new boat being made there at New London, and that was great duty. But uh, the second choice I had was Southwest Pacific, and that's where I went. We went from there, took us 40 days in a troop transport to get to Admiralty Islands, and from the Admiralty Islands, we were there a couple of days, and boy, I thought that was great duty. But we were only there two days, and they put us on a, a fast cargo ship. It was a, sort of a tramp steamer, they used to call them. Went to Brisbane, Australia. And from Brisbane, Australia, we got on a, well, I guess you'd call it a troop train. I don't know. Went from there to Melbourne, to Sydney, to Adelaide, all the way across the country. And of course, at those times, we had to change trains because the gauges were different all the way across to Australia. We finally ended up in Perth, which is on the far side of Australia, and it was a great city to be in. People there loved the Americans, and we got along with everyone very, very well. How old were you at that point? I was 19. 19 years old. In fact, everybody on our submarine was about that age, and I don't think our skipper or the exec or any of those fellows were much over 30, 31, somewhere in there. And most of all, even the officers were uh, Naval Reserve. The skipper and the exec were uh, regular Navy. And did they all treat you fairly? You get treated great on a submarine. And I remember our skipper saying, if you get in trouble on the beach, don't worry, because if you're with me out of sea, you'll never have any trouble on the beach, and uh, the beach being on land. And uh, it turned out to be very true, very true. Because, of course, we did a lot more drinking than we should and uh, did some things we weren't proud of. And uh, the skipper was always with us, always said, no, no problem. Because I've gone out, I remember one time I went out in uh, uh, <coughs> Honolulu with the chief yeoman. We were just pal around. And uh, we got picked up for drinking, so forth, <coughs> so forth, and being there was a curfew and we were past curfew. And of course, I was put in the, the Marines put me in the stockade, and the next morning they delivered me to, the, to our boat. We are tied up there in uh, Honolulu. And at that time, the, the uh, yeoman I went out with was there to receive me. We came on, he took the charges against me and tore them up, threw them right over in front of the MPs there, and the, which made me feel good. So nothing ever became of these things. This happened a lot. And we've had uh, officers come back in the after battery of the cruise quarters and play cards and so forth. They had no problem. Of course, everybody had never, no one wore a hat or anything. The officers didn't. Most of the crew were just shorts with no shirts at all, at least out at sea. And uh, we wore leather shoes that we had purchased in Australia. Of course, we cut them all up, make sandals out of them. But it was, it was very, everyone was very close, very good, and the crew got along 
very, very well. You almost had to, though, didn't you? Well, we were forced to pretty much. It was, it was hot. Now, when you were off duty in enclosed quarters, would you rest and play cards, sleep, yes, read, exactly. write letters? And uh, a lot of eating. We, uh, we had beef, particularly all the while. The first roll in the run we went out, first patrol that I was on, I was the second patrol of the boat operating out of Australia. Australia had lots of beef, but they also have lots of mutton. And mutton down there is basically fat. So I remember the skipper saying, no more, we're not going to carry any more mutton. And at that time they gave a, a certain amount of money that each boat could buy their food with. So he was limited. He says, well, I don't care about that. He says, I'm going to go overboard. He says, you're going out. You don't know whether you're coming back or not. Why should we be worried about a little bit of money, what we're going to carry? So from then on, we carried lots of beef. We always had sandwiches around. We had a lot of steaks and had good food. There was no getting around it. Now, so you were stationed out of Perth? Perth, Australia. Yeah. And where would you go from there? Well, we usually, our normal run would take us from Perth we would go up and top off in Shule in a little uh, community up uh, north of Australia. I can't remember the name right now. Exmouth Gulf. Exmouth Gulf. And from that point on, we'd go in our patrol area. We'd be up off through Lombok Strait, up there where we uh, patrolled in the uh, western part of uh, the South China Sea, which would be uh, Gulf of Siam and that point there and up towards uh, Saigon, which is now north, uh, somewhere or other, north, sometimes they've renamed Ho Chi Minh that Ho area. Chi Minh. Yep. Yeah. So uh, that's where most of our patrolling was done. And did you meet up with any of the enemy? Oh, yes. I don't think there was a submarine out there that didn't. In fact, my, my first patrol, the sub second, we went up. And uh, they picked up a pip, we called them on the radar at that time. It was quite a ways away, and it wasn't going too fast. It was daytime. Now, would a pip be like a blip on yep, the exactly. radar screen? Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It wasn't going too slow, so we stayed back. Because a submarine cannot be seen very, even at daytime, because the silhouette is so, so low, and so there, there isn't much there to get a picture of. So when it got dusk, we put on steam on the surface yet, and got closer to them, got in range, went to battle station. At that time, I was uh, my first patrol, so I was back in the after battery to help load the torpedoes. So we were back there, and uh, nobody was upset, but we did go to battle stations, and from the surface, we fired, I think, six fish forward, and uh, we were turning around to get our after uh, torpedo room in range. And we were shooting at what we thought was a battleship and a cruiser. It turned out to be a heavy cruiser and a light cruiser. Well, they took one salvo at us, and they happened to hit us with one shell, and it was armor piercing, so it went on through our pressure hull and didn't explode to got to the far side of us. But doing that, they did go through our uh, pressure hull, which means the water is going to get into the sub if we dove. So we couldn't dive, so we had a little bit of a problem. Well, the skipper was told by the Navy officials to go to a certain island, and at that point we would uh, stay and we'd be picked up and we would scuttle the submarine. But the skipper said, no, I said, too good a boat, too new, we, we can't do that. Could I ask here what the name of the submarine was? Burgall, USS Burgall, and it was number 320. And how do you spell that? B-E-R-G-A-L-L. -L. Burgall. Burgall, thank you. And mm -hmm. it was a fish, don't ask me what kind, but it was a fish, because at that time they were all named after fish. But at any rate, they, held, they hit us, we were headed back. So we met another submarine, it was coming up north, and we were heading south towards Australia. And uh, most of the crew was transferred to the other submarine. Now, I think it was the USS Harder, but I'm not sure. I think it was the Harder. And I was transferred to the other sub. But consequently, the two of us on the surface had a long ways to go, several thousand miles to get back through the Exmouth Gulf. 
or Lombok Strait rather, and get towards Exmouth where we were safe. And at that point, we all went back on our sub and got through. Well, the sub got the unit Navy citation out of that little deal. So we were proud because we just got back into Perth. It was quite, oh, not quite Christmas and we all had two weeks leave in Perth. Stayed at a hotel right in Perth, had our Christmas dinner there and it was a, a great, great deal because we did get through it all. When did you have to leave the sub? No. Did, did they haul it back? How did they get well, it back? Well, the sub got back on the they surface. The, they saw some planes, but the planes never spotted them. We did get all the way back. Mm -hmm. And the, so time that were the closer area going through Lombok Street, go through the night time, so they couldn't see it quite so much. So as a 19-year-old in the dark, mm -hmm. your first, as you said, your first patrol, what were your feelings when you were having to abandon the ship, well, the sub? <laughs> At 19 years old, you didn't worry about any of this. You had all your friends there, and quite frankly, I never thought anything would happen. I just never gave it a thought. As we got back, and it's all excitement, and we're young, and we enjoyed it. And I don't remember the crew ever being that upset about anything. And there were no injuries? No, well, one little injury, because the, the shell went through the forward torpedo room, and there was some shrapnel from that. A couple of fellows up in that room got a little bit of shrapnel cut, but nothing to speak of. But then the problem, even at, on the surface, <coughs> you, you sit so low to the water, that water would come in there, so they took so, uh, blankets, uh, anything they could to stuff up that hole to keep a lot of the water coming out. But of course we had bilge pumps and all, so we could keep it down. Theoretically, uh, a submarine is be able to go down, flood two compartments, and still the people could get out of the mumping lung and get out. But unfortunately, this was a forward torpedo room, which is the largest room, largest compartment. And uh, they were a little leery about whether it was gonna work or not. But that was the plan. They had rigged the sub to be uh, demo uh, demolished by, to, uh, by bombs and so forth, charges. And uh, it was gonna submerge, get the people out, and they were gonna destroy it. But thankfully, that never happened. We did get back to Perth, and we put in four more patrols after that. So it worked out very well. On the same sub. On the same sub, yeah. We thought we'd be going back to the States after that. We were all happy about that. But unfortunately, to us anyway, they were able to repair it in Australia. And they had to weld in new sections and so forth, and new wiring and all that. But they were able to do it. And I don't think we lost more than maybe two weeks before we went out to sea again. Was there any anxiety about going back out? No, no. Oh no, everybody wanted to go out. Everybody wanted to be a part of the war. They really did. And the submarine went out of it. He had more action, and they all had a lot of action. But the ones that had more action, their crew was more content and happy than if they didn't. So consequently, uh, it worked out very well with us and most submarines out there. While you were out there, did you have air support? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. The air support we had was all Japanese. We couldn't call it support. So did you personally have any close calls? Not really. Mm -hmm. No more than any member of the crew would. Got to remember, the submarine goes out. They don't come back if there's any injury. Basically, they're down and it's gone. They go out, they never hear from them again, and they send back or the, the report is it's lost in action or went out and never returned. But uh, no, personally didn't, the whole crew did. Actually, uh, <clears throat> the submarines lost more personnel for the number in the service, in submarines than any other branch of the service. But they did a lot of damage to mainly, they did a lot of warships were sunk by them, but mainly it was merchant and oil tankers, uh, particularly because they were bringing the oil up from the Borneo and the southern area up to the islands there to use it. And, that's what hurt Japanese me. They just didn't get the supplies, and as the war went on, uh, they didn't get it. The subs would track those. Oh yeah. And then try to yep. destroy those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you talk about Perth, and it sounds like you had an enjoyable time there, what do you remember about the climate? You said the people were friendly, but the 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 atmosphere and the look of the place. Well, it was a it was a smaller city. 
and uh, there was no large buildings of there. I think now there are, but uh, it was very, very nice city. People very friendly. In fact, my name being Smith, we ran into a family there by the name of Smith, and I dated their daughter, and she was Sheila, which is a common name in Australia, Sheila Smith, and I dated her for a while. And of course, the submarine comes in, they have what you call a relief crew. And in my beginning in the, that part of the area, I was a relief crew. And of course, we went in and repaired things that were damaged or had to be replaced on the submarine. And of course, you go in, the submarine has food in their regular storage room, but then they stick it all over the stuff. Wherever they can find a little bit of room, they'll put some canned food. So we used to take that and take it over to the people that we knew. We also carried five pound containers of tea. Well, when I took this tea over to this family that I dated their daughter, that was like giving gold. They really loved that. So uh, we were very friendly. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, the father of the, I suppose you call him the senior member of the family, uh, he drove a taxi cab. And maybe people will generally remember they had a big container on the back of the car and used charcoal and he'd go out and stand to get gas to the fumes they could burn the, the, you know, the car. So that's what his job. And we go into Perth, we were about maybe, at, at, <clears throat> actually we were Fremantle, which is about 10 miles from Perth on the Swan River. And uh, he would love to take us in. He didn't charge much because he we take us out, take the daughter out and all. And uh, it's funny though, when they go out, they'd run out and he'd go out and stamp that, whatever you call the thing to make the charcoal and go on into Perth. So that happened lots of times. And in fact, I had a birthday there and they had a party and they had a lot of fellows from their boat and they had dates for everybody. It was just a great place to be. Did you ever go back? No, I never went back. I'd like to, but I'll tell you, to fly from this area to California and California to Australia and then all the way across there to the Perth, which is at least halfway around the world. It's just too far. Mm -hmm. Did you keep in contact with anybody that you met? No, with? unfortunately not. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately not. Um, when you talked earlier about uh, the friendships and um, the camaraderie on the submarine, and you mentioned the officers were um, regular people and also helped you all. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that they had good leadership too, the oh, officers? Yeah. <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> quite frankly, even as a seaman first class or fireman first class, I happen to be a fireman. And uh, when you think about it, I grew in a little town in the States, never been to sea or never knew anything about the ocean. And you go there, you go, you're inducted into the service. They send you to boot camp up in the middle of New York State. There was no ocean or anything around you. Send you to diesel school in Richmond, Virginia, which never saw water or anything. Then they send you from there up to New London. Well, New London, of course, uh, is mainly school, a very intensive schooling. And towards the end of there, we go out on a, which is called an O-boat, the smaller submarine they used in World War II. So we went out on those and make two or three dives, I think mainly to get you accustomed to what's going on. And they would weed out fellows all the way along if they had any problems with claustrophobic or if they had, they had pressure tanks that we went into or test your ears, see if you could stand the pressure. And then the, I'm sure people have seen pictures of the diving tower they had where they put you in that and you had a mumps and lung and you go up in that. All these things got to the point where you uh, knew pretty much about what was going on in the submarine. So then when you get out in Australia like you did, we were uh, a relief crew for a while there, and you're learning about subs because you're working on them. Then you get assigned to a submarine, and uh, you're still not a qualified submariner yet. So you get tests, you do more things there, and eventually you get to where you're dolphins, and uh, then you become a qualified submariner. Um, and could I ask, dolphins are striped? They're the little emblem emblems they wear, and the uh, officers have one up on their uh, 
let the fly them themselves. And uh, by the time you're there, <clears throat> you go out several break crews, you know, to getting uh, accustomed to all this on the submarine. So uh, by the time we got on the Burgo and got on, <clears throat> the crew was pretty well assembled by then and knew what there was coming up. And they also went through the same training, only a lot more intensive in New London. And uh, it, was, it was a very compatible crew. And you see movies on television that shows the different problems that the crew's having, and it really isn't like that at all. Because, uh, well, the little things that happened, like we had an ice cream maker, and uh, that took up room and we carry a lot of ice cream powder and you mix it with the water at that time and freeze it and make ice cream. I found out the fellows were not making a freeze, they were making milkshakes out of it because why bother to freeze it? So they took out the doggone ice, uh, the ice cream maker, just carried the, the uh, powder to make this because it was so much uh, more room to carry that and that's what everybody was do, doing anyway. So little things like that go on. But the skippers were in the fore to a pretty room where the officers, and uh, of course they're, everybody's going back and forth to their quarters, but uh, they got along very well, got along very well. And of course there you know all your officers, they never wore hats or helmets or anything. So uh, it was very compatible crews, they really were. If you needed any kind of medical attention, did you think that you got good quality attention and it well, wasn't on the sub? Yes, we carried a, a, a full a chief, uh, I guess you call them uh, pharmacist mates, and they were pretty well trained. Now, one of our patrols, we were out, and of course I being in the control room, their lookouts up on the bridge, we heard them say, object bearing such and such a way. So the skipper says, well, how far were about? So he told them and they looked and headed in that direction. And then a little further along, he says, uh, it looked like a, 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 some sort of a boat or life raft. We kept going closer and he's blinking lights at us now. So we went over and we picked up three fellows were shot down in the B-25 because this is a little further in the war and there were planes around the area more then. And a lot of them were shot down. Well, these fellows were on the, the uh, life raft, well, there's a small dinghy like, and they were burned mainly because they got, uh, when they were down, they were burned. So that pharmacist mate took very well, very good care of those fellows and they kind of got back and they were fine shape. Of course, they had nothing to wear, so they were wearing all our uniforms and so forth. And I can remember one of the fellows, ah, there's nothing to this. This is, this is beans compared to flying. Well, about that time, a plane did drop a bomb close to us, and a little later we had some depth charging. So he said, no, I guess it's pretty rough after all. So we got into Perth. Of course, they had no uniforms. They went out as sailors that time, and we had some pretty good times together with those fellows before they went headed back to the base or back to where they were stationed. But the pharmacist mate did take good care of them. And the wounds were fairly clear, clean because of the salt water. It hurt, but it kept the, the uh, wounds clean. So they, they got all the care they needed. But that's why we had a pharmacist mate. And of course, being young, you didn't have many problems with sickness or anything. I can't remember any of the crew ever having any problems, really. <clears throat> how did you get word from home, and how did you, or did you hear anything about the progress of the war elsewhere? Well, late in the afternoon, just be, I, I would think you'd call it dusk, is when the submarines used to surface because it was getting dark. About an hour then, <clears throat> we would pick up the radarman would pick up all the information, wherever ships were, where they're headed, what their cargo was, <clears throat> how they got all this information. Personally, I never knew, but they had all the information so that any sub in that general area would go, go after these ships. At that same time, towards the end of that, they would tell you in one line sentences or a paragraph or two what is happening in the war. So that's basically uh, the information we got until we got into port, then we get a little bit more. 
but you're more concerned about what you're doing and where what's going on anywhere else. So after Perth, did you have uh, during that period of time? Did you have any additional R and R or? or well, breaks? we had some uh, in the beginning. Soon after we got to Perth, we, it was called Subron Six. That's what the relief crew was called there. We had uh, identification of ships and airplanes, schools of that nature, and uh, night vision. We took quite a little night vision courses, which was very important when you're lookout. And that's the only thing there that we did. And then from Perth, um, where did you go from there? Well, we made four more patrols out of Perth. The last patrol, uh, the Philippines was getting pretty well settled by then. <clears throat> so after that patrol, we pulled into Subic Bay in the Philippines, which was maybe 100, 150 miles north of uh, Manila. And uh, we all hated to leave Australia because we figured, well, we'll never be back here again. In fact, uh, one of the chiefs had a girlfriend over on the beach. Actually, he was chief of the boat, which was the top chief of the submarine. and. Uh, Came time to leave, he never showed up. So what the skipper said, and this follows through what I was telling you about him. He says, well, he says, he's just too good a man to break. He says, I'll just transfer him to the beach and he'll pick another submarine later. So he just transferred him, that was it. He could have been really hung out to dry, but he did. But then we pulled into Subic Bay, we were kind of disappointed. But after that run, we had been that was my our fifth patrol, I believe, fifth or sixth. After that run, we were damaged. We hit a mine, so we all had to go back to the States. And uh, the mine damaged the, the uh, screws in the back of the propellers, and they're all out of line for making too much noise, so we could never operate as a submarine. So we went all the way back to the States, and we pulled in New London, pulling into New London. <laughs> we had a small fire on the boat, and finally they had to have a tug come out and push us on into New London. Well, that made us feel, here comes a rusty old beat up boat coming in and being pulled in by a tug. But anyway, we got on there, and uh, then from there we went out to Port and New Hampshire, where they repaired the sub completely. And uh, that was in the beat, that was about, 40, beginning of 46, somewhere around there. I think it was, now it's toward the end of 46, because I know I was home when the war ended, and that was August. So I went back overseas, and uh, back to Guam, taking the boat back out there, and then I was discharged from Guam, actually, and got a, another troop transport to get back to the States, landed in San Francisco, went across the train, and got in Toledo Beach, Long Island, where I was discharged from. And what was your ranking when you were discharged? I was motor machinist, third class. And we signed up to make a second class right away, but nobody wanted to sign up, so that ended it. And you were, at that time, did you say San Francisco? When we you? pulled into San yeah. Francisco, yes. So, did you... What were your feelings then? Did you feel like, what now, or great, now I'm on vacation? Oh or? yeah, we all knew we were getting out of the service, at least the fellows that wanted to. And it was a very good feeling, that's all I can say. Couldn't get out fast enough. So when you were discharged, um, did you want to get home right away? Oh yeah, naturally. And once you got home, did you discuss any of your um, adventures with your family? Well, somewhat, somewhat. A lot of fellows there got out and of course there wasn't too much work around. And I'm sure everyone's heard of what they call the 5220 Club. I've heard of it, but why don't you explain it? Well, I don't know if it was federal government state, I think it was federal, but uh, if you couldn't get a job, for 52 weeks you'd get $20 a week. $20 then was a lot more than it is right now. But at any rate, that became the 5220 Club. Well, at that time, I wanted to go to college, so uh, I knew I had the GI Bill. So uh, I applied all over the 
the country really because uh, everybody wanted to go back to school. So I was going to go back to Syracuse and I was uh, wanted to go into architecture, but uh, they were filled up and they accepted me for a straight art course. So I accepted that, although I didn't really want it. And at the very last minute in September, I got a letter from the University of Cincinnati that I could be a, uh, accepted as an architectural student, as which, which is what I finally did. So you went to the University of Cincinnati? Went to the University of Cincinnati. That was a six-year course at that time. Was it difficult for your family for you to leave again? I don't think so, I really. Uh, one of the, there were three of us in the service, all three got back. One of our sons started a business right there in the hometown. He lived with them for quite a while. So I don't think so, really. Did you join any units of the military reserve? Well, quite frankly, no, didn't, didn't join the reserve. Okay. A lot of people didn't want to get that because they knew what that meant. And a lot of those fellows went back into the Korean War. So the uh, time I got out of service, I figured, look, there are so many veterans at that time. Actually, if you joined one of those, you'd be a, just a pressure group. So I didn't join any of them. Later on, I joined uh, the World War II Submariners Group, which uh, I've been a member of that for about 10 years, though not, not really active. Did you keep in touch with any of your submates after uh, the war? One was quite close, a little, little village near us, and uh, we ran into him a few times. But other than that, we didn't. We really didn't, no. Not to, I wish I had, but we didn't. So you joined later for the subgroup, the World War II submarine mm -hmm. group. Did you attend at any times any of their reunions? No. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of them. It was one a year, but I never attended. But never you, went to any of them. Do you get newsletters? Oh, yeah. We get a, they put out a magazine three or four times a year. I get that. And uh, that has a lot of information in. And, of course, now on the computer there's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we can find all our patrols, they're all in on the computer, so that's where I got a lot of the information in a written form. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, I'll tell you, at the time, I don't think it was anybody that didn't want to get into the service. The fellow didn't get into the service, they felt bad about it. Of course, there were a few fellows that didn't want to go, but that was strictly a minority. Everybody wanted to go into the service. In fact, in my senior year in high school, three of the fellows quit high school and went on in and joined up right away. Uh, one of them was a Marine, and he just died recently, so he had a good full life. And uh, most of the guys uh, just wanted to get out of the service and get their life going again. Do you feel in any way that your military service and the um, training that you got affected your life in any way later on in life? Yes, I do. In what way? I think, uh, I think the military was good. Probably shouldn't say this, but it gave a young kid a lot of chance to sow his wild oats. Do his drinking he's going to do, and there's always buddies to get you back. So we always did too much drinking. Let's, let's face it. And uh, I gave us a chance to grow up, really. So when we went out to Cincinnati at the college, I think almost everyone in the class, except maybe just one or two percent, were all veterans. And they all at that time were ready to settle down and uh, work hard in college. And uh, we had a lot of good times out there. Everybody worked together, worked hard. And I think military did, had a lot to do with this. And quite frankly, I think a lot of kids today, which I think is happening, go into the military, get enough money to go on into college. I think it's a good thing for them. What are some of <clears throat> your um, remembrances of a memorable character or uh, someone that caused a bit of humor or, or someone you just couldn't forget brings, well, brings back memories? There was another auxiliary by the name of Clarence Speck. And he and I became quite friends. He was from Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska. And we palled around a lot. 
and uh, he was regular Navy, so when the war ended and I came home, he stayed right on the Burgle, so I kind of lost track of him. But as far as the Burgle, it was in, uh, stayed in service for a while, and uh, eventually was sent to Turkey, but I think we still had control, but they were kind of using it. And then finally it was decommissioned, and I have no idea what happened to it. I'm sure it's an old, it's razor blades now, probably. How about a humorous experience? Well, there were a lot of those. One I can tell you about happened when I was at New London. I was there with two other friends, both from our area in Walden, New York. And uh, I got a letter from this girl in Walden saying, oh, she's going to be looking forward to seeing me Saturday night on my liberty. And she's thanks, thanked me for the, having her as her girlfriend. We we'll go out on a date. So I never wrote this girl. So then the next week I get another another letter from her. She's very sorry I didn't get off the boat and had to stay on board. <coughs> Excuse me, but she said I'll be looking for you this weekend. So of course I didn't do that. I got the third letter from her. So after the third letter, I wrote her a letter telling her that this was a prank that the other two were doing. So what they had been doing is writing her a letter, setting up a date for me, and I didn't even know the girl hardly. <laughs> so that was humorous. Some of the other things that happened in Perth were just, some of the things you did on Liberty, I don't even want to tell you about. They did too much drinking, that's all I can say. Was that difficult then when you came back? Were, were there any issues with you or any of your friends about that? After we were discharged? Yeah. No. Because no. you went on to yep. college and tried a to... A lot of fellows did then. A lot mm -hmm. of them went to, into college and so forth. Well, are there any thoughts or um, any other incidences that you'd like to share with family or other people who will be watching this tape? Well, I don't know. Frankly, it was uh, for a young person like myself, it was just ideal, ideal service. Because we were all in it together. We had good camaraderie had a uh, pretty well selected fellow to, that got onto submarines. Of course, it was a volunteer. Everybody volunteered to be in it. And uh, it was just good, good service. I can remember when we were in diesel school, landing barges was a big thing, getting ready for landing barges and diesels and all that sort of thing. So a lot of us figured, boy, here we are in diesel school, and uh, they're all going in landing barges an attack, which can be really rough. So we found out we could sign up for submarines. Well, that was pretty exciting too. And not only that, we could get delayed orders to get to New London, which would give us three weeks. So that's nothing but leave. And out of uh, New London, you got three out of four Liberty. Had a good deal. I could always get home on weekends and all. So we thought, well, we'll take the chance going to submarines. So I think every one of us that signed up there, there weren't too many, all went to submarine school and found it very enjoyable. So of your friends from <clears throat> school, from high school, mm -hmm. many of them you said went into the Navy. Mm -hmm. Did they all come back? I think we lost maybe two out of the 10 or 12, something like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, some other friends that weren't in my class went down because they're a little older and they got in the service and uh, a little sooner. I remember at that time, my middle brother, my brother's just above me, he uh, wanted to get in the Canadian Air Force and a whole bunch of fellows then, just a little bit older than me, went up and joined the Canadian Air Force. And there must have been 10 or 12 of those in our little village. And I can remember only one that came back. And it was a, the Air Force at that time, it was just a matter of time, you go in and, uh, make certain uh, um, sorties over there, sooner or later you're going to get it. I remember only one came back and he never flew again, never went in a commercial plane, never did a bit of flying. He had it, so those things do happen. So but most I, people came back. Am I to understand that perhaps your brother did not come back? No, both my brothers came back. They did come back. Yep. Mm -hmm. One, in fact, my one brother joined the Navy in 1935. He got out of high school and you couldn't get a decent job. I remember he was delivering bread and no decent job. So he said, I might as well go in the Navy. So he joined the Navy. 
and he was at Pearl Harbor, and uh, he became a chief radio man. So he, uh, he did a lot of his operating out of San Diego. He was up in the Kiska Islands, up that way, in an old four-stack destroyer. And uh, he spent a lot of time there. I think he had seven or eight years in. But when the war was over and he got a chance to get out, he did. And uh, of course, just before he went into service, he did get a job as a butcher. So he learned uh, that trade. So I remember the story he talked about. He's on this tin can, they call it a four-stack destroyer in old ones, about all they had in the beginning of the war. And uh, it was a Thanksgiving to see, and he saw the guys in the galley there cutting up the turkeys and all. So he said, hey, you need a hand in there? So he said, oh, what's a radio man know about cutting meat? So he said, well, I'll show you. So he went in and gave him a hand in cutting up their turkeys and so forth. Then they realized what had happened, that he was a butcher. <laughs> My other brother was in the Air Force. He did uh, most of his most of his service was taking up planes after they were going to, just being built, got them dead and checked out all the radio equipment and so on before they went overseas. So he spent most of his time in the service in the States. Well, as we finish <coughs> this up, is there anything else, uh, any additional comments or anything that we didn't ask or anything you'd like to leave us with today? Well, I really appreciated my time in the service. I appreciated my time in the Navy. And I think our government at that time setting up the, the school setups they had and helping buy homes, I, I took advantage of the college. And uh, we went to a cooperative school where I would be in school for two months, work for two months, make a toll for six years. So I was able to take the uh, money from the government when I wasn't in school. I could stop it because I had a job. And then when a, two months of the work was done, pick it up again. So I got almost all six years covered by the government. I got married while I was in college. My wife completed her senior year in college out there. And it worked out very well. And then when it came time to build our home, when I got out, out of school, uh, we held help with that. So my time and my response to our government in this country was great because I didn't go in, of course I came back. And of course that means a lot too, I suppose. Sure. But uh, I was treated very well. I, for a person my age, getting out of high school, <coughs> excuse me, going into the service, enjoying it, and really going through a lot of excitement, which you're ready for as being a young person, getting out and being treated well by our government, that I think was a great experience. And I'm, most people my age I would feel the same way, I'm sure. Well, Kenneth Smith, we appreciate your stopping in today and telling us a very, very interesting story. Okay, Thanks I for coming. I appreciate it coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.